Today's presenter is Duke Port, Pinnacle Strategies Viewpoint Product Manager. Duke is a project management expert with over 25 years of experience developing and executing management solutions and facilitating organizational change. Duke is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and completed his postgraduate work in aeronautical science, curriculum development, and educational leadership. He is a TOC Jonas Jonah and is certified in both Lean and Six Sigma process improvement methodologies. Duke, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to this opportunity to learn a little bit about how uh, I've discovered we can improve execution in our distributed teams. What I'd like to start with was a picture that I saw uh, Mark Weppel use in one of his presentations. And he started with this one. This is a actual photo of one of our customers in Houston. And what you see here is a group of people standing at a morning stand-up meeting in front of a small magnetic board. And the question he asks is the same question I want at least people to think about. Is this really an execution management system? And is it, is it effective in that role? Well, the answer to that is this little tool uh, that they post in the wall had a lot of behaviors behind it, had a lot of uh, information and rules and responsibilities set up for each one of these engineers that the engineering manager as the gatekeeper established. And just by setting that board up, what he gained was he reduced their product time, cycle time by 27 percent. They had 100 percent on-time delivery of their three-month backlog and for the first time this organization was able to forecast their engineering availability for future projects and predict actually when they could finish the project. So something as simple as a tool like this can be very effective if used correctly with the basic foundations established that this manager was trained by our Pinnacle team to use. So unfortunately, guys, that's not the reality in all of our projects. We know that a lot of projects fail. As a matter of fact, the Stanish group, when they did their chaos study, they said 75% of the projects are commonly late. They say that the average cost overrun is about 189%, and the average schedule overrun is 222%. So obviously there's some problems out there, that are there out there that are hindering our projects from progressing. So to start off, to make sure I'm focusing on the things that you want me to focus on, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you a question. And we're going to use the polling capability of uh, GoToMeeting here. So Jennifer, go ahead and bring up the first question. Okay. This question is, what is the biggest challenge you're having when you execute a distributed team? I'll give you about 45 seconds to put your answers down. And Jennifer, is it possible to share the poll results? Yes, Duke, they should be shared now. Okay. And let's see. Let's go ahead and look at them now. It says organizer must hide the poll results to enable screen sharing. So since I don't see them, Jennifer, can you tell me what the results were that you see from so far from this one? Yes, it looks like they're pretty divided into two. Um, the f number one is poor communications, and about 71% said that's their biggest problem. And then number two is unrealistic expectations with about 29%. Oh, this is excellent, guys. This is exactly what I wanted. I was hoping the answer would be because because we're talking about distributed teams, the issue is primarily in communicating, or one of the main problems we have is in communicating with those teams. So I want to go into the next slide, and we'll start with that, and we'll start with the specific issues we have in dealing with the challenge associated with this communication, this, the basic issues that you have in distributed teams. Okay? 
we know that managing any project is difficult. But when you're talking about multiple teams uh, that are distributed across different buildings on the campus, uh, or different countries, or even different continents, the complexities increase as you get increased with further and further distance. And those challenges increase in three basic dimensions. The first one is the one that most of you agreed to, and that is poor communications. When we collaborate across distances, we know that bringing everybody together for a meeting or a call is difficult. The time zones alone. I have a team that I'm working with in India, and we have another team in Singapore, and trying to bring the entire team together with all the different time zones and include our European team is almost impossible to get everybody at the right time. So it, that difficulty in just getting the people together compromised decision making. In addition, the fact that there is actually a distance, that distance actually delays things. As I discovered, when you add a, a few miles, it adds a few minutes. When you add more miles, you can go up to hours, days, or even weeks to get the essential work of executing these projects done. Working those multiple locations add wait times for parts, information, decisions, responses, plans, and more. The other thing I find when I execute my uh, distributed projects is there are just too many variables. Managers have to address too many moving pieces, uh, and it's too, there's too much data out there that they're having to work, work on and make decisions about and sort through. Uh, years ago, when I was uh, a battle staff manager for NATO, uh, my commander, uh, General Ryan, he was addressing this exact same issue. What he would do in the morning meeting uh, during combat operations, what would happen was he'd have an intel group from the U.S. come in and brief him on all the intelligence they'd receive, all the information they have on threats, on problems, on issues. Then a NATO team would come in and give him more information. One day when he was at briefing, I remember him stopping the entire briefing, and he was a little upset. He said, guys, all you're giving me is a bunch of data. The data is useless to me. What I need is processed data. I need actionable information. What he was looking for were those uh, critical nuggets of actionable information that helped him sort through and make correct decisions and appropriate decisions despite all this massive amount of information that he was receiving. Well, project managers, if we get, you know, our project plans have information, inputs from all the different sources, from sub-suppliers, from all the different stakeholders, as we get all these, these inputs, they cloud sometimes our decision making. In that environment, we have to have a different type of reaction. And so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take these three, and I'm going to call them multipliers, multipliers, because what they do, they magnify the classic problems we're facing as project managers. And I'm going to focus on a few specific projects that I found that we need to definitely address whenever we're addressing projects in a distributed environment. First thing I want to do is just a reminder that uh, essentially, what are we really there for? As managers, it's not our job, as project managers and portfolio managers, it's not our job to be firefighting. It is essential that we devote less and less of our time firefighting and we use our scarcest resource which is our management attention to manage the higher level things to manage the stakeholders to keep the big picture in mind when everybody else is potentially firefighting the problem with firefighting is if an organization starts rewarding firefighting then everybody wants that reward so they want to see the fires they want to see the problems in projects we as managers want to make sure we can avoid those problems, that we don't become the firefighter and use up all our scarcest resource, which is that management attention. So to do that, in a distributed environment, what we need to do is we need to attack two things, and that is first, data profusion and location confusion. The ugly truth is that the traditional tools for attacking these problems don't always work. Things like spreadsheets, groupware, shareware, and as we know, the more and more meetings we hold, they fail to master the actual complexities that we need in this type of environment. The combination of that data profusion and location confusion, it makes it very difficult for us as managers to reconcile the problems, the issues, the resources against the work. 
Uh, classically, what I've seen is in projects, the one approach is to attack it from the team side, where we focus on effective management, we focus on clearly defined roles, we focus on uh, conflict resolution mechanisms. These are all necessary, but unfortunately, they're not sufficient since they don't address the fundamental issue of completing the work necessary to complete the project on time. So what we need to do, guys, and what I'll be talking about is we must master that location confusion with superior communications and collaboration, and we'll be going over ways that I found to successfully do that, and you must control the data profusion with more effective ways of compiling the data and distributing and displaying the information so people can get the big picture very easily. All right. Now, what the four areas I'm going to look at, and I'm going to take those magnifiers and apply them to each one of these four areas that I consider key problems in distributed environment are, first of all, basically the synchronization of the work and resources. As you can imagine, that gets more and more difficult as we add on distance. Next one I'm going to focus on is managing deadlines, meeting those commitments, uh, and the things dictated by the project or your internal resource availability. You can also look at reconciling the resource capacity and workload. And finally, I'll take a look at uh, managing risk in this type of environment, in a this type of distributed environment. So the, the basic plan for the rest of the presentation is I'm going to go over each one of these four. I'm going to look at them in the context of the magnifiers, which are the poor communications, the distance and delays, and the too many variables, and show you how you need to overcome those or your projects are going to be in jeopardy. And I'll show you some techniques I've used to overcome them. And then I'm going to go to real world examples. So let's go ahead and start right now with the first, which is the synchronization of work resources. Now, the very essence of our teamwork in executing projects is communicating a shared vision. And then communicating a shared action plan that synchronizes all our efforts together to a common objective. Well, this is a particular board we, present, we developed in, um, this was in Dallas. And this team is synchronizing their efforts uh, to ensure each of their projects, each one of those cards, by the way, are a different project. They're synchronizing their entire effort to get the entire portfolio of projects completed as rapidly as possible and as effectively as possible. Unfortunately, when teams are dispersed on different floors of a building, different uh, buildings in a technology park, different cities, different continents, then communicating that shared vision gets more and more difficult. Even status updates are sometimes difficult to get and to understand. Unfortunately, as you move further and further away, that vision of the plan, the vision of the goals, start getting blurrier and blurrier. Across distances, you try to facilitate communications, and it becomes more and more difficult. Decision-making decelerates. Resources far from the corporate headquarters have more and more difficulty connecting the dots and knowing exactly what they need to do. Even difficult to understand what the real goals for the project are at times. They feel these distant managers don't understand their problems. And this reduces the team, the sort sense of accountability and the morale. In this vacuum, sometimes those resources feel they're being forced to do things that they don't fully understand why they're having to do it that way. This causes distrust, and it further degenerates and reduces the opportunity for everybody to see that big picture. So how do we do that? What should we do to address this issue? Well. Classically, people try to close these gaps between team members by sharing information. Unfortunately, the classic tools that we have out there from presentation software like the PowerPoint I'm using um, is static and doesn't facilitate effective two-way communication. I'm sure you've all, we've all been in meetings where we sit there and you'll have somebody in the background uh, playing with their computer, someone else uh, having a conversation. They can do that because they mute themselves and the corporate or the project manager doesn't know that they're doing these other things. Or they can be like uh, Senator McCann. He, they were talking about him in the news tonight. He was at 
one of the hearings for the Syria issue, and what was he doing? They have a photo of him playing poker on his on his computer. So these this can happen during our collaborative meetings. So we need to find a way to make that. that opportunity, make that meeting as effective as possible. Now, things like a tool like this, like using GoToMeeting, uh, they're better, but they still lacked a way to collect data, a lot of data, and for all men to, all team members to see the actual manipulation of that data, each person to have, be able to interact with the same tools at the same time to effectively uh, progress the entire effort forward. forward. Okay? Effective communications synchronization they demand what I call a higher discipline. Um, in particular, the team must be purposeful in two dimensions, which I'll talk about. And they are, they must be purposeful on the content and the frequency that takes place in their meetings. These are essential. So, the first one I'm going to talk about is how often should we meet? Well, early on a project, I think we should meet really often. And I'll explain kind of why. Because there are two factors that you need to consider. And the first one is how fast are the tasks being completed. If you have a lot of tasks completing every day, then you want to move people on to the next task immediately, and you want to move on to the next correct task based on the current completions. As we know, current completions are going to affect your critical path. Your critical path is where you primarily want to focus the people on. So to do that, if you're ta a lot of tasks finishing daily, you may have to have a daily meeting. As your project matures, you can slow down that rate potentially of how often you're having the tasks. My goal is I don't want to give them my resources four, five, six tasks and say over the next week work on these five tasks. The problem is it's going to create multitasking, which is just going to slow things down even more. So the next thing I want to do on determine how often I'm going to have the meetings is What's the risk if I don't complete that task on time? If the risk is high, I better have my meetings often enough so I can ensure that if there's any obstacle from ensuring that a key task is completed, that I can be there the second it's recognized and we can move the entire project forward. We're looking for that natural rate. And that will develop as the risk is reduced and as you get the rhythm and the tempo of these classic meetings. Classic, by the way, the meetings I'll be discussing with and describing during this presentation take between 15 and 20 minutes. And we run them classically starting out once a day, call it a stand-up meeting, and then later on we'll reduce that to maybe twice a week. Uh, to look at that a little closer, I have a question for you. So Jen, if you'll bring up the next question for the team. And I'll give you another about 45 seconds here, 30, 45 seconds to put your answers down. Okay, Jen, you can start uh, letting us know how the things are looking right now on the polling for that question. The question was basically, what should we discuss in that meeting? Okay, the results are now shared, and it looks like the majority are saying what needs what to do to move the project forward with 88%, and 13% discusses the project status. Okay. And I'm kind of glad 13% did that one. So I'm going to go on to the next slide and explain uh, why I don't think that one is an appropriate thing to discuss at the meeting and what I mean. You know, it's kind of interpretation. But So I'll go to the next slide. Okay, what do we really need to discuss at the meeting? And I think most of you had it right. The, in my approach to uh, meetings, what I focus on in my meetings, the reason I can get my meetings down to 15 to 20 minutes is I don't focus on the status. The board is the status information. It needs to be updated before everybody shows up. So now when people show up at the board at this type of tool, whatever it may be, this is just one way to depict a portfolio board, then what we start discussing is we focus on what needs to be done. Now, this I'll just quickly explain this type of board. All this is is each one of those cards is 
a project. And they move along, and it's a portfolio team. There's actually four teams here, but the top one, one team's discussing the top swim lane or the top column. And the process is along the top of how what every project goes through in a process. So the, everybody can look at that, and somebody can look and say, for instance, this card right here, in the middle here, it is currently in the detailing phase, and everybody knows that's where it is. So I don't need to say it's in the detailing phase. I don't want to waste the time in my project talking about what happened. I want to focus about what's going to be done, what needs to be done. Now, on this particular project, you'll notice a bunch of red stickies. What those red stickies on the project are, they essentially are identifying a problem that needs to be fixed. So the next thing we want to talk about, if we're seeing problems, we need to identify something is halting the progress of those of four cards there. Red markers are identifying that. So we need to identify it. Just so happens that Sammy, who's a young lady in the orange shirt there, she happens to be the QA manager, and that each one of those red stickies are showing that these cards have been halted because we don't have a QA resource available to complete their portion of that effort. Now, what we don't discuss in the meeting also is I want them to take follow-up action, so we're going to identify who needs to do it, what needs to be done, and Sammy, in this case, was looking at all this. She recognized that she was a follow-up action. Her name was put on the cards, and what she does after the meeting is come up with a solution. So at the next meeting, she'll say, I've solved all those problems, or this is how we have to attack the addressing and getting these things moving forward. So this 15-minute meeting is primarily focused on what needs to be done today and in the future, what is stopping us from progressing, and then even you don't even talk about the specific solution if it's going to take too long. Real quick, you can discuss if it's going to take time and people so you don't have to involve everybody, you take a small group after the meeting to discuss how they're going to address the issue. Now, does this type of approach work? Well, let's look at a real-world example. Okay, First of all, there's an oil and gas company we were working for, FMC, and they feared that they were going to fail to deliver on a new product that they were developing. The trouble was their customers were relying on this new product for supporting a new oil fill they were putting down. Uh, Pinnacle, in particular, I was able to help them recognize that in the delivery of this new product that they were delivering, they had a bottleneck, and it just so happened that the bottleneck was a chipset de chip design for a critical component. The team responsible for that design was located a long ways away from the rest of the organization and was in a totally different department. Okay? They'd essentially caused the team to fall at least four months behind schedule. So, timely communication was vital. Getting the team to regular face-to-face -face meetings at the upper right, you see a paper board we put up initially. Um, getting the chipset design team and the people responsible for that to our means was very difficult. So what we did was we computerized that in an electronic tool and now in the different location they should see the very similar information they could meet and they would understand exactly on a daily or twice weekly they could see the status of the project and how they were the direct cause of the project being four months behind schedule. Okay. When we, when I finally departed, I did the report, and essentially what happened is the team was overwhelmed, was the word they used, by the amount of work they had completed using this methodology and this type of visual tool to see the big picture, to see where the roadblocks were. They closed that four-month gap in less than a month and a half and got back on track to delivery of this, all these new technologies to their customer. So yes, the tools do work and they're successful. And they don't have to be complicated. One of our customers uh, in Houston had this board we posted for them initially. And all those stickies, they're just individual items of these valve gate bodies that are going to be delivered. And if there's a red sticky on something, as there is here, it's showing there's a block, a bottleneck that is causing problems. Now, when you convert this in a distributed environment, because you have a board like this could not be seen by all the potential players and stakeholders, you can put it in a distributive tool. You can see a big picture. You can drill down. It's the same board, but you basically have 
a drill down capability to see each and individual task. I'll talk about this board a little bit more, but what I want to do is I want to step on to um, the, the next issue in our, our four urgent challenges. And we'll come back to this board periodically. It's not a mandatory that board, but it's just a tool we're using or finding successful in managing distributor teams. The next problem, the challenge that we want to talk about, is this whole issue of fixed deadlines. Now, if I look at those multipliers, those same multipliers, you're going to see we know that making deadlines is always difficult anyway with all the changes, with all the requirements. But as you move into a distributed environment, the volume of data increases. The amount of data coming from multiple sources can overwhelm our ability to form an accurate picture, right? Uh, we can't see that on the ground picture that is sometimes out there. Like General Ryan, he was getting all this data and he didn't know what the on the ground activity and what was essential to the success of his operations. As this volume grows, it gets more and more difficult to sort the unimportant from the important and clouds that decision making process with trivia. Okay, And unfortunately, dislocated teams start making different decisions. So with this, before I move on to the next one, I want to ask another question for you. Okay, so Jeanette, bring up the next poll question. Jenny. Let's take another 30 or so seconds and do the same thing. So Jen, how are we doing? What is it looking like on our polling? We saw a few people that look like they're in the middle of voting at the moment. Okay. So we have a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Looks like most people are done voting. All right. And I'll share the results. And it looks like it's pretty evenly split around the top four. So there's hide relevancies and creates confusion. Both came in with about 30%. And then inhibits corrective action and improves the project, or improves the change, improves the changes that the project will succeed. Both came in at 20%. Okay. I kind of put us uh, some misleading information there, and I want to talk about it a little bit. In this particular question I asked, that last one I don't believe at all is true, and I'll kind of explain why. So you can bring us back to out of that. Um, I believe that for over the last 30 years in project management that uh, I've t played roles as I've been on the planning side, where I was a planner, and I've been on the execution side, and I've been on the management side at many levels. And what I discovered was my initial theory was if I, the more detail I provide, the, it improves the odds of them not making a mistake and then doing everything correctly. Unfortunately, what I rapidly discovered when I was on the out of the planning side and into the execution side was the more detail there is, the more difficult it was for me to do my job. There's a right level of detail, an appropriate level of detail. Otherwise, that excess of detail was hiding the relevancies. It was inhibiting the corrective action. Me having to figure out exactly where the problem was and then seeing the impact as I worked within Microsoft Project or other tools were hindered. And it did. It added to the confusion that existed. You may have heard of a book by, called The Haystack Syndrome. It's written by Dr. Golrat and he came out with it, by, I believe, in about 1990. Uh, the book is discussing how this whole Haystack Syndrome that is discussing how Finding that needle when there's a lot, a lot of data, a lot of information, a lot of things, of things, information being provided to the leadership is actually hindering it. It's getting more and more difficult to find that needle. Now think about it. If we're in a co-located environment, that works out better than if all of a sudden we're in a distributed environment where sometimes there are multiple haystacks and people are picking the wrong haystacks. And then they pick their needle, and the project manager ends up trying to decide, huh, what's the right needle? So in a distributed environment, project managers 
have difficulty sometimes sorting the information and then at a higher level it gets more and more difficult. All right. The next issue that affects deadlines is the reliability information. How accurate is that information that we get really? And what happens when that information is wrong? Does everybody still have the same consistent uh, picture? And are they are using the same dates? Well, I want to dive a little deeper into that and look at how project managers are given information, all this unreliable information, right? We know that we don't always get reliable information from our team members. Um, but the nice thing is, if you're co-located with your team, you can walk down there and ask them what's going on, and they can give you an answer right then. If you're in a distributed team, you have to make contact with them and try to find out what's really going on. Okay, And in doing that, they may not have the same picture of the clear path ahead, so they have a misunderstanding. You may have not communicated team to team. That's that's the reason I like using a, a board or distributed tool, because I can show them exactly on the path that I'm describing exactly where we should be. Next, the decisions we're making are unreliable because the information we can get is limited by all that distance. And finally, in a distributed environment, priorities are clouded by that time and distance. They act as an additional barrier to the path forward. Local managers end up imposing potentially their own timelines or their own deadlines on the team and it's not always based on the same priority that the overall project or portfolio manager has. So the common result of all this is the work's not completed when expected. This unpredictably aggravates, aggravates an already difficult project management situation forcing managers to get involved more and more in the detail put out fires, let's spend less time focusing on the management, the big picture, and project success. The last of these areas is an inconsistent vision. And we've kind of alluded to it a little bit with what I was talking about recently. And in this case, we know that the teams, when they're distributed, they, they're classically uh, operating a bubble of their own tasks or their own subtasks for a project or subprojects. The trouble is they don't necessarily see how all the pieces relate together. They don't understand how one missed milestone can affect the entire project, and they don't necessarily understand uh, how making an arbitrary uh, decision on what they think is the right vision for the project is going to affect the tasks that are selected, and that's going to affect the entire project. So what should we do to overcome? these type of issues in projects. Well, first of all, what I recommend is uh, what we need to do is we need to have a shared vision. Now, this is the one we used for a company. Uh, this was for a board we did for BP. And uh, when we created this board, by the way, the process runs along the top, all the process steps. And the these are oil fields along the, the rows yeah, along the left-hand side. All those cards are projects that are going to be done for a specific oil field. And with this type of shared vision, the, somebody could look at the board and see their, if their card happens to be this one, this yellow one down here. Well, they knew exactly how it was progressing, what stage it was in, and if it was not identified with a tag of some type, that it was proceeding normally. So what we need is we need a shared view of the project status so we don't have to spend time talking about it. The board portrays that. We can focus on the obstacles that impede process, the progress. I'll show you a simple one. If we notice this light green uh, group down here, this row right here, you notice that there's a lot of stuff and then there's stops and there's a big gap. That's showing me something. That gap alone is showing me something is causing all these projects to back up and stop. This could be an approval process. This could be a uh, an organizational decision meeting. It could be a lot of things. However, in this project, I can see an obstacle. I also identify obstacles with stickers I stick on the card if I have a known issue that needs to be overcome. So in addition to the project status and the obstacles that were 
running into. We also need to see, okay, what's coming up? What do I need to be doing? What do I need to be working on right now? And we need a simple and effective strategy to leverage all this, this type of information. Now, back to that board I was showing you before. Uh, the electronic version of it, you can take that exact same board that I just showed you and put it electronically so you can show a team, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, and in this particular case, it's showing a little bit of informa additional information. I can see down here in the bottom, I can see the risk level, this is my buffer burn, but my risk level is high, it's red. I also see some red dots on this which identify these tasks are blocked. And I can talk about this in my meeting. In addition to my meetings, I can actually write in the meeting say, okay, this task right here, let's move it. Let's move it forward because that one is completed. The anywhere, per people anywhere can actually move and show the progress of these efforts. Now, does this type of situ these type of tools actually work? Well, let's talk about one of our customers. Okay. Uh, what they were doing was, this was FMC in Norway. They're a manufacturer of subsea oil and gas technology. They actually found themselves a victim of their success. Uh, and because they were getting more and more customers for their new uh, flow meter that they had created, they were getting to the point where they could no longer meet the contracted delivery dates. The flow meter is the you know, big yellow thing in the bottom right-hand corner. So what they're classically a solution when you're having a problem like that is better planning. So they actually hired somebody and brought somebody in from Singapore, one of their offices down there, one of their, uh, high power, one of their most experienced planners. And she came in and she worked the plan, developed, you know, refined the plan and everything. Unfortunately, the plan wasn't the problem. The problem was essentially a bottleneck in a supplier. And that happened to be this supplier you see here on the left. It's a small company was was producing a sensor that was added into this flow meter to uh, to serve its function. Well, by identifying, using a collaborative tool, a board, to identify where the problem was and then helping the company focus on that by using collaborative tools, a, a virtual tool that shows the status of mutual big picture board of the entire thing. They recognized the impact they were having on the entire project. So by just doing that, helping them identifying it, helping them recognize and prioritize their product because they saw all the work coming, they could see all the work that they needed to get out, they could prioritize their work better, and here are the results. 433% increase in effective capacity, 326% increase in the units they shipped. The lead time was reduced from 31 days to 8 days, and there was a significant increase in revenue available. And the simple solution was basically one of the boards I've showed you before, providing that big picture to the team. That's an essential way to do this. Okay? The last one I want to look at really quickly is, uh, the last problem is capacity management. Now, even the best capacity management systems, we know they fail. In a distributed environment, uh, our customers need to know when you can deliver. And we can't predict when we're going to deliver if we're not able to judge our load versus our actual capacity and then flow the work out appropriately. The things that cause the problem are, again, in a distributed environment, it's very difficult or impossible for managers to catalog all the skills, all the skill sets, all the resources from the different regions in one comprehensive understanding of the available talent. Next, it's very difficult for them to get an accurate picture sometimes. And that can be caused by sometimes the suppliers don't even have an accurate picture. That supplier I basically talked to in the last exam real world example, um, they didn't have a way of estimating how long it was going to take to do things. They knew all about how long they took to do it, but they had so many customers and they had so many minor differences in this, they didn't have an accurate estimate of what their capacity or what their load. We provide them the load potentially, but they didn't know what their capacity was. The next issue is potentially commonality. When you're dealing in a envi distributed environment, it's difficult to equate resources because of minor differences in language, uh, minor differences in what a specific job title means, what the descriptions are, 
the job description, what the roles and responsibilities. And these render the classic uh, planning models or resource models unusable or sometimes, as a minimum, unreliable. So if you spread that landscape across multiple projects, it's compounded with different understandings of capacity, different understandings of resource schedules, work policies, time zones, agendas. This data profusion and the inconsistencies that make it very difficult to assess capacity, getting an accurate picture. Again, that haystack syndrome that Dr. Golrat discussed is common in this environment and makes it very nearly impossible to pull the reliable estimates out of your teams. So how do we overcome this? Well, what we need is we need a common understanding, and you need to work on this from the very start, help your suppliers, help everybody understand the importance of capacity, and provide them an early forecast of this month you're going to get this much, this month you're going to get this much of the work coming to them so they can better plan for it. Next thing you need to do, you need to have a rec method of reconciling the capacity and the work. I think I can best describe this with another uh, real-world example that we, uh, we had, and that was at BP. Okay? After the oil spill in 2010, um, BP had the job of cleaning up more than 14,000 vessels that were part of the operation. These vessels and the, were being cleaned up at uh, facilities all the way from Tampa on the east to Texas City on the west, ports all the way along. Each of those ports had different water depths, specialties, capacities, and as they started to adapt to this environment, they began to realize they were closing some old ports at the same time they were uh, opening new ones. So what we did is we decided, Pinnacle, we went in to create, turn this into a, basically an approach of a giant factory without walls and floors. Okay, in that environment, what we did was, with this new assembly line approach, we went out and surveyed and looked at all the uh, cleaning operations and what capacity existed. Initial measurements showed us that the uh, they had only about half of the spaces filled. They had plenty of capacity. In addition, we discovered that because we had so, they had so many contracts from all these different boats, and these in the past have been competitors. Well, now we're trying to get them to work together. So the direction of the solution was to create a visual board and visual communication tools and common sheets or data sheets to collect all the required information. They went across board, they did all this. The visual tools and templates were put in place. Critical actions were taken to boost the, the process and look. Here's the type of result you get out of this. In this particular case, in cleaning up after the Gulf oil spill, all the vessels and everything, they tripped by just setting up a simple big picture view and communication tools. They tripled the rate of decon. The project was finished in one third of the time allocated, <coughs> and they expected, and they saved $700 million. So yes, these tools do work effectively. Now, the last area I want to talk about really quickly is assessing risk. Now, it's always a challenge to assess the risk in a project. We all know that. This remote environment, this tribute environment makes it more difficult. And the difficulty comes from classically, I can use even an example of just something as simple as estimated duration in a, pro in a task. Traditionally, we know project, people, they take a task, and we ask for an estimate of the duration, and you can use per, you can use a number of methodologies, but you need to at least consider the pessimistic, because things will go wrong, and we know they will. In themselves, we know that people, what they do, they'll build a task, and everybody puts a little bit of pad in the task, especially more experienced people, they put a pad in that task to protect themselves. Unfortunately, if they've got, it's gonna take about five days, and they put about five days of pad in it, well, when are they going to finish? If they've been given 10 days, are they going to finish five days? No. Normally, we all know they're going to finish at that 10 days. So they're wasting the pad. It'd be nice if there was a way we could put that pad under the control of the project manager. So the specific issues we're talking about in a distributed environment, 
that don't allow us to do that very well are the fact that distance insulates leadership from the resources making those estimates and making assessments of risk. Obstacles are not necessarily quickly identified and communicated. Now, why would that be? Well, sometimes um, people don't want to identify the risks because that may look poorly upon them. It may reflect poorly upon them. So what they do, they delay passing, you know, this is a problem we're having until it may be too late for the entire project. During execution, a project team, they have lots of difficulties. That distance obscured the actual work being done. And so in the dispersed team environment, the dispersed teams are forced to make educated guesses on what they should do and how they should respond. So what do I recommend? What I recommend to master the risk in attributed teams is to use essentially a uh, three things. First, you need to develop a shared understanding of the work and the safety. In other words, you need to be able to separate out the two. So what I do classically is I just start and I ask for a most likely duration on a task. And that's what I put in my project plans, the most likely. Now, because I didn't put account for the pessimistic, I need to account for the pessimistic somehow. And what I do is I normally create contingency. We all know, unfortunately, that when we try to build contingency into a plan, a buffer or protection at the end. Leadership doesn't like to see that. They think that's an opportunity or something they can cut from our project. I've been very successful at convincing all my leaders, maybe not the customers, but my leaders, that I need a contingency that is the pad I took out of every task. Now, the next thing I do is I report, I have the team members to help me assess this risk and respond to risk. I have the teams not report, report percent complete but instead, how many days are they going to be done? The reason I do that is I found over the years that when I ask somebody how far, how long, how complete they are, how many more days, or anything, if they give me percent complete, they say 90 is percent complete. Well, that doesn't mean anything. If it was a 10-day task and they said 90 percent complete, that does not mean there's one day remaining. We all know that. What I want to know is I, I just ask them specifically, how many days are you going to be finished? I build that into my project plan and I can immediately see the impact. And I also know, is it a big deal? Is it really a, a problem? If it's not on the critical path, the current critical path, them going over may not hurt anything, and that may be OK. I may even pull resources off some tasks to put it on a critical pan, path task to reduce the risk in my project. The last thing I need to do is I need to be able to measure the risk by looking at the, the safety and the remaining duration. And how I do that was I use a simple tool. Not anybody can create this with Excel. And what I did was on the bottom axis, I just said, so let's say the project six months long. Well, 100% of the duration time available for that project is six months. So as the project is completed up to six months, which is 100 days, on the uh, left axis, I show the critical path complete. And I'll show you how I use this. Let's just look at the at one of these project, because this is a portfolio view of entire project. I've got a project here down at the bottom, the dots of projects, normally that have names on them. In this case, I've got a project that has 20% of its time elapsed and is only completed about 2 or 3%. It's got a problem, but it's still got a lot of time to work on. It's still got 80% of the time. I can look at another one of these. Here's another one. This one is about 15% of the time elapsed the time available is done, 15%, but they've already completed 30% of the critical path. I've got a way I can measure projects. So now I can know that a project like this one over in the bottom right-hand corner is it is 20% of the critical path is complete, 85% of the time available is complete. So you see the projects in the lower right are the ones at most risk, and as you move up into the left, the projects are less and less at risk. So now I can make decisions on applying my resources appropriately. And it's simple to do with the information you currently have available on your portfolios. Does it work? Well, I'll give a real little example. For the United States Air Force, the urgency of our project was defined by the most extreme condition possible, supporting warfighters on the ground. During Desert Storm, the Air Force project managers 
uh, they were overseeing three specific smart weapon development projects that were essential to some of the operations that were going to take place. Each of the project managers, working from the different locations, uh, were overwhelmed by the pressure of meeting you know, the wartime demands, and they were continually asking for more resources. I was the portfolio manager, and I took a slightly different tact. What I did was, I, ha I pulled all the resources together, matrixed them together, and I built a plan with all the projects on it, all the key projects, and I staggered them based on their actual due dates and resource availability. I actually you can actually see the green here, they are buffers I put in, some contingency that I convinced my leadership that I needed. I could then look across and see the resource loading and I could make decisions on which work I need to pull forward. And the, the kind of barred or grayed out portion, that is one of the projects and then the next project comes on, some of the things are exceeding the capacity, I can pull work forward. I also use a risk measure, this risk register here on the portfolio and I looked how, where were they on this chart? upper right, bottom left, bottom right, where were they and then I could assess the risk and deploy resources based on the highest level of risk. Was it successful? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, all three of these weapon systems were delivered on time, none at the expense of the others. These, this general idea is they do work. So, can you really see the big picture? Okay, that's the question I want to ask you. And the way you know if you can see the big picture is essentially by asking yourself a few questions. And here are the questions, all right? Uh, here we go. Can your project manager see beyond the task into the larger project? Do resources set their own safety or is contingency, is the pad controlled by the project manager or responsible manager? Can you allocate time and resources empirically rather than by arbitrary demands? In other words, are you giving your resource out based on who's making the most noise and screaming the loudest or based on real data? Do you have an integrated means of visualizing the big project, the overall project? Are the promises you're making to your customer based on objective data that everybody can actually see? Can rem you coordinate your remote teams in one common invisible purpose that everybody can see? Do you have an effective way of meeting and communicating and sharing information regardless of the distance? Are you able to ensure your key resources are not overwhelmed by conflicting demands on their time and talent? And can your organization balance capacity load through the entire workflow? Guys, if you can answer most of those questions correctly, a lot of them, then you can actually see the big picture for a project because that's what the goal is. How we move on, well, let's find out. What can we do next? I have another poll question. Jen, could you bring that up? It's kind of an easy one. What can you do to start improving your execution today? Take a couple of minutes to put down what you think you can do, and then I'll talk about what I think you should be doing. Okay, Jen, how are we looking? We'll just give a few more seconds for everyone to vote. All right. All right, it looks like we have a majority of the votes in. <laughs> and I bet they're all the last one, mainly. Is that true? Uh, it's pretty evenly split, actually. It's a split between all the above, as well as focus your meetings on what moves the project forward. Outstanding. So people are picking actual solutions that will work for them right now. And that's really what I wanted to get to. I was hoping that not everybody picked the last one because you need to focus on something specific. Can you bring our next slide up and close the poll? Um, essentially, guys, what do you need to do now? What do I recommend you do? First of all, uh, I recommend an easy solution is get all your project status information prior to a meeting and have it all distributed and the latest information so you don't have to spend time talking about it in the meeting. You can cut down your meeting significantly on focus on those things that are essential to the success of the project. We don't need to focus on what we've already done. Let's focus on what we need to do to get success, be successful. I recommend you have some type of visual depiction. That first board I showed you really early on where I use that as my starting point for the entire presentation, they didn't have a fancy tool. 
they had that magnetic that magnetic board and they were using the background tools Excel to populate to make sure everything was correct they were using so I recommend you come with a visual depiction that can highlight these things that everybody can see then I want you to initially in the meeting focus on task completions what if because if you don't have the current status if there's something that we just now finished make that minor adjustment that time you shouldn't have to do too much if the project was updated prior make those new completions and then now focus on the obstacles what needs to be done to go on and is there anything stopping and impeding our progress and I also recommend you keep the meetings if you do this you can keep those meetings short classically my meetings stay when I get to 30 minutes I immediately stop the meeting no matter where we are because people need, actually need to get out there and do the real work so I focus them and I say okay we need to cover this next meeting and you guys need to have a offline meeting to discuss this obstacle so that's what I recommend you do right now Okay, now with that um, Jim's going to be helping you out a little bit because if you want next what's next well you can go ahead and get a best practice consultation she'll tell you how to do that you can also view a LinkedIn group that's available um, it's called visual project management they'll help you out with a lot of these ideas and there's actually a remote control ebook which discusses all the stuff I've been talking about uh, so far so Jen all right thank you very much Duke for that great presentation